Kia ora koutou. Good evening, everyone. Oh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our session this evening about all of the myths to bust. And I'm so excited to be joined this evening by Dr. Ben Peters. Hey, Ben. Kia ora. How are you? So good to be back. It's I'm great. So it's good. good. I feel like I haven't seen you in yeah, it's been a while. It's, uh, you know, the old the election got in the way a wee bit there, but we pushed through that um, back out to just do some more science. So that's, that's really my wheelhouse. I love that. And uh, for some of you joining, you might recall some months ago, Ben and I did a few of these where we just sit here and chat and answer your questions that are related to mostly the COVID, COVID vaccine. And we started these some months ago now, I think back in maybe July, June, July. And Ben, did you ever think when we were having those chats that fast forward six months, we would be having another one of these lives to talk about a vaccine that's actually out there being released to the public? Not this quick. Um, it's, it's awesome. Um, and it's not just one. You know, we've got uh, two or three that are um, at the stage of getting approvals, emergency approvals in different countries. So, I mean, I guess if you count the ones that are also a little bit dubious, they're up to about five, I think, vaccines that have emergency <laughs> approval. So it's it's getting pretty big. Um, and it seems um, like that's actually going to have a huge impact, uh, both on New Zealand and on the rest of the world, which is, which is awesome. You know, the US is up to 3,000 deaths a day. Um, so really, the sooner this can get rolled out, the, the better. Definitely. It's pretty incredible the speed that this has been rolled out. And I've got a lot of questions that people have already submitted, um, but we will be taking your questions this evening. So please plug them into the comments and the team will feed them through and we will try and get through as many questions this evening uh, as we can. But one of the things that I just wanted to start with, Ben, is how can we allay people's fears? when this has gone through so quickly compared to almost any other vaccine that I, as a layperson, know of. And so naturally that's going to cause perhaps heightened anxiety around the safety of this. What do you tell those people? Well, first things first, in New Zealand, there's no rush to get the vaccine. And I think there's a strange piece of advice to start with, but we currently have a strategy that is keeping the virus out of New Zealand, and we're not going to ditch that overnight for a number of reasons. So we have the luxury, because of our really good COVID response, that we can take our time and wait for those full safety profiles to come out. For the countries that are giving emergency approval, it's because they have thousands of people dying every day. Um, and so the bar of safety um, is lower when you have people that are actively dying than when you're in a country where you have literally no COVID deaths, where you have zero community transmission. So for New Zealanders, we have the privilege of taking our time and seeing what is happening in the rest of the world to see those full safety profiles come through. Other countries are going on early data that's coming out of phase three trials, which has so far been very good um, and, and that we haven't seen major side effects coming through. We will, there are still some mild um, and moderate side effects, so you'll feel some soreness, some illness um, in the days following. Um, but we don't have access to those full data profiles, and it's still a somewhat limited sample size in terms of number of people that have actually had the vaccine for long enough to be able to start looking at those. So New Zealand's lucky we can wait. Most of the safety data we've seen so far is really, really positive in that it looks very well tolerated. It looks like um, we're getting some good responses um, internationally, and yet we can wait to see after it's been rolled out to literally millions to, to make our call, but uh, likely um, as the FDA has approved um, some and the UK has approved some and um, even Russia and China, but are slightly different cases where they got approved kind of before the safety information was fully known. Um, here we can see, we can wait um, and we can really be quite confident when New Zealand says, yes, we're going ahead, that that, that full safety um, check has been achieved. And so what's really involved with the phase three trial? So phase three is where you want to recruit enough people from enough different demographics, from different age groups, um, that you can start to see if it's actually effective enough. Um, so the early reports you would have heard was, you know, Moderna's vaccine or the Pfizer's vaccine achieved 90 plus percent um, effectiveness. 
And what that means is that they've had enough people with the vaccine also get COVID that they can then calculate those statistics. They had a minimum report number and that was once they had 10. Um, so 10 people with the vaccine also get the illness, then they can count up all the people that didn't and all the people in the control that did get COVID and then make that comparison. So the data we're seeing now about efficacy of the phase three trials is not the full and complete phase three. That's still going, that's still recruiting because they need to hit those really, really big numbers, those thousands, tens of thousands of people um, to really make that um, the, those statements on the final efficacy. Um, so the phase three is really just recruit as many people as we can, get good statistics, record um, anything that happens illness-wise. So you'll see reports of a side effect um, and you need a lot, a lot of people to be able to tell whether that was a side effect caused from the vaccine or if it was actually just because illnesses happen. And when you're vaccinating a lot of people, a lot of illnesses will happen at the same time as people have a vaccine. So phase three is focused on efficacy, but also at that point they're checking, as you've said, the side effects and things. My understanding yep. had previously been that the side effects and stuff would get sorted out or tested earlier, but is that not necessarily the, always the case? Uh, well, it's, the side effects never stop getting tested. Um, the earlier phase one and two look for kind of immediate effects. Um, and also look for severe effects. And so that will absolutely kill a trial if that starts happening early. Um, the phase three, you start getting a big enough sample size that you can start looking for really rare events, right? So um, if an event only happens one in 100,000 times, then you need to vaccinate at least 100,000 people before you can start seeing those very, very rare events. Um, and because vaccines are given to healthy people that aren't sick yet, we have a really high bar of safety compared to a medicine that you give to someone who's already sick, where it just has to be better than the illness. So vaccines have that really high bar of safety where we do need to run these really huge trials um, to be able to kind of spot any rare side effects. So that will be ongoing. And also, even after the phase three is finished, they still have, most countries have reporting systems in place so that if a person does come down with an illness after a vaccine, even outside of the trial period, that still gets collected um, and goes into informing and we can also, in New Zealand, we'll be able to choose uh, which vaccines are coming in um, because there are so many that are being effective and we signed up to multiple different sources. So we hedged our bets, which was probably quite smart, you'd yeah. argue. Very, very good. Yeah, um, <laughs> full credit to the government for doing that. That's nice. It's good credit where credit's due. That's really important. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, everyone, just a quick reminder, if you've just jumped on, we will be taking your questions. I've got a few to ask in just to start with, but do feel free to put your questions in and we will try and get to those. Um, so, Ben, what I'm understanding is that, you know, in the UK and the US in particular, they're rolling them out now. Any changes that are needed will continue to be, they'll be continued to be adapted and evaluated as they learn more. So we yep. will get an advanced version of even what's being rolled out now, probably. Uh, so it's unlikely that they'll reiterate the vaccine before we get it, but we'll have a much better and uh, effectively pool of information to draw from. So uh, like I'm seeing one of the comments coming in here around the uh, warning in the UK around the Pfizer vaccine and those with severe allergies um, opting out. They will put up that warning early because they've seen some kind of anomaly in the data. That will take time to investigate to figure out if it actually is a vaccine issue or if it is just uh, um, within the, the pool of people, um, a number are having a reaction that are having a reaction to something else not related to the vaccine. So we will get that information because that will eventually come through. And so then we'll be able to advise people as to, you know, if you do have severe allergies that require you to carry um, sorry, the EpiPens, um, then, then we can advise them not to take that particular vaccine. We'll be able to get that information. Likewise, at the moment, uh, pregnant women are not advised to take it, so it hasn't gone through the, that level of safety checking yet as well. So we are still in the early stages where the vaccine's really only getting rolled out to those where it's most necessary. So the really vulnerable population and the really high at risk populations are the ones that we're really looking at getting that vaccine to. And that doesn't actually include New Zealand, potentially frontline staff, but most of New Zealand is so isolated from the vaccine that isolation makes more sense than the vaccine at the moment. And we were chatting earlier, Ben, that uh, possibly politicians will also be in the 
the list for the first ones to get access to this vaccine. Yeah. I saw a great uh, anti-vax post uh, being like, you know, we can all agree that the politicians should be first in line. That way, if it's not safe, they're dead and you can, you know, uh, not control the population or, or whatever that particular conspiracy is. But, you know, hey, if, uh, if being a politician gets me a vaccine early, I'm keen. Um, I'm happy to put my money where my mouth is there and um, <laughs> sign up and get one of the new vaccines. Um, I think it's, it's important. I think it's actually quite important that um, leaders show leadership um, and that they are, you know, if you're pushing something to the public that you're willing to take it yourself, I think that's incredibly um, important. Okay, so I'll start getting through some of these questions, Ben. Do you, and, and some of them, by the way, Ben, you might not even know the answer to these. So um, just we can skip those. But um, see how we go. We'll see how we get on. So do you know um, when New Zealand should expect access to the vaccine? No. Um, and that, that is entirely up to the government, right? So the government, if they wanted to, I mean, that. So New Zealand would have to go through, get approved by MedSafe. It would have to get purchased. Although the purchasing has already been done, as far as I'm aware, because the government has budgeted that outside of Pharmac. So it, or, or they've dedicated within, I'm not sure exactly how that budgeting decision was made, but the government set aside the money. Um, and so now it would just have to go through um, New Zealand's medicine checker, which is MedSafe, and MedSafe would make the approval, and then it could be distributed to New Zealand. Um, because those studies are still ongoing, um, those trials, and because we have a system in place currently um, to check that, it will, we will get it later than other countries that are experiencing much more severe um, outbreaks in their country. But I mean, definitely within 12 months, um, I'd be very, very surprised if it was more than a year that we weren't getting at least vaccine in for our frontline staff. Um, and for people that are really at high at risk of um, an infection, so potentially um, our elderly population as well, are likely the two demographics which are targeted early. And does anyone know, based on these trials, the length that they predict the vaccine will last? Do they Are they predicting at the moment it's a year-on-year -year type of vaccination? Are they predicting longer? Or they just don't know? Not not that I've read, um, it's a not, not that we know, right? You can, you really, yes, I think early stuff they were looking at about three months out, it still looked like there was an antibody response, which is promising. You know, if it wasn't there, that'd be very concerning. Um, but we have no real idea as to how long that immunity will last. Um, I do know that most of the vaccines are a two shot vaccine. So you need to have two doses, um, a couple of weeks or about a month apart, depending on which one. Um, and that gets you uh, quite a high level of coverage. One shot still gives you a reasonable um, amount. So it's about 80% effective from one shot, gets up to about 95% effective about two weeks out from your second shot. So it's also not um, like the day after you're vaccinated, you're not immune. Um, it does take time for your body to build up that immune response and then remember that in its memory cells. And... Okay, this is kind of um, niche. Is there any information yet around any links of sterilization connected to the safety of the vaccines? Yeah, so this is this is an interesting uh, question. So um, a, I think I would categorize it as a conspiracy is going around um, where there's some similarity between the COVID uh, spike protein um, and a particular protein that's important for fertility in women. Um, and so the theory goes that we're developing antibodies to the spike protein that will then also react to that um, uh, fertility protein. And what that will do is render women infertile. The problem is that that similarity is six amino acids, um, I think when I checked, which is absolutely minuscule um, and not really enough at all to develop an immune response to. Um, and if it did, we would have a much bigger problem with COVID um, in general in that um, the, your body's own antibodies to COVID uh, would be rendering people sterile as well. So, and, and then if that were true, we would see in the patients, the COVID patients, especially pregnant women um, or women who are, um, which there had actually been quite a number that have been documented, they would be having much more difficult pregnancies and are often probably not uh, fruitful pregnancies. We haven't seen that in the data. So we are seeing that women are largely able to carry children to term um, with COVID. And so that hasn't been 
um, reported there was also no real biological link between those two proteins other than a really, really small level of similarity. Um, proteins in general, about 100 to uh, 1,000 amino acids, so they're quite big, and when we're talking about eight here. Um, so it's a really okay. small amount of similarity. We don't we'll see it born out of the data, this. and we don't see it in the... Yeah, yeah, it's busted. Um, so it, it's not, there's not a plausible biological mechanism there, but I just want to go a little bit into mm. it in case someone actually pushes back on it. It's really like, interesting. There is, like, there is, yeah, yeah. Good, good, helpful. I'll remember that one. Um, now I've already answered that question. Will, do you think that vac the vaccine will be mandatory for frontline workers? See, I would have said no before. Um, but they then started making testing for frontline workers mandatory, which was a little interesting. Um, so I, I, I would still hope not. And again, this is a political decision that Labour has to make. Um, so far, they've been pretty clear in not making any vaccines mandatory. Um, so I would hope that they still hold true to that. Um, it may be that in order to hold that particular job, you have to have it. Um, but again that that is really just a political decision for labor um and i would still err on the side of not i know a lot of people love the idea of mandatory vaccines i jumped on a uh Dunedin news subreddit and people going oh all vaccines should be mandatory and um you know a reasonable amount of support there but the reality is that that will just push people away and isolate them from healthcare. um and then you can have outbreaks that are hidden for a longer period of time and a hidden outbreak is much more dangerous because more people can be infected. So then you have, it's harder to track it. The earlier we find these outbreaks, the much better we are at actually being able to shut it down. So keeping people engaged, even if that means a few people aren't vaccinating, it's better to have that than have them hiding. Mm, most definitely. And that's the research that says it just, it doesn't work. What works far yep. better is focusing on education campaign. And that yep. will have a far bigger impact on bringing the public with you in learning more and understanding and more in, you know, busting the myths. Um, so, Ben, you're already doing a good public service joining me this evening. So that, thank you. That is the hope. That is the hope that we can just uh, <laughs> answer those questions and then we can, um, yeah, get, get confidence in the vaccine when it comes here. And part of that will be, you know, as the data comes out, being able to share that openly and going, this is this is the tangible risk because there are always risks. There will be some illness when you when you take the vaccine, um, ranging from absolutely nothing to some, some soreness or some fevers or things like that. So, but yeah, um, in, the, in the whole scheme of it, if we can stop millions of people dying, I think that's uh, pretty good, pretty worthwhile. So I've got a couple of questions here about the strains. So is, are there different strains of the virus and is one vaccine for one strain only? Excellent. So strains are a little bit of a loose term um, biologically in that <coughs> once there's enough of a difference, scientists just call it another strain. Um, there's not a particular bar that needs to be met before it's specifically a different strain, <laughs> uh, at least my understanding of that. So there are lots of strains around. Uh, but the differences between those strains are not actually often significant. Um, there's only one really which is starting to cause a little bit of concern, which is in the UK at the moment. So that was breaking in the last kind of day or two. So they're starting to see a strain that has uh, mutations in the spike protein. So um, the virus itself is this big kind of ball with some little things sticking out of it. And the little things sticking out of it are what actually recognize your cells and help you infect it. And that's called the spike protein. So you hear a lot about that because it's kind of the focus of all of the research. That spike protein, um, if that gets mutated, that can make it harder to recognize it because pretty much most of the vaccines target the spike protein or have some kind of code that produces the spike protein or have just the spike protein on its own. So if that starts mutating, that is very concerning. Uh, and it may be that the vaccine then is unable to um, prime or, you know, kind of make us immune to that particular strain. Um, although, because that's also the protein that's used to infect your cells, if it changes too much, then it won't be able to infect your cells either. So it's this bit of a catch-22 where because we've managed to target the thing that is crucial for infection, if that changes, then it may stop the infection happening in the first place. So... Yeah, most likely 
vaccines are going to cover, a, like the vaccines currently will cover all of the strains that are going around. Potential caveat on that little UK strain um, that might have enough difference that it has a slightly dampened effect um, in terms of its immunity. But by and large, um, we're not, this, va this, vac sorry, this virus seems very stable. It's not mutating much, which is good. Um, so the vaccines are likely to cover a large range of those. Okay. Sorry, very long-winded. <laughs> no, it's so interesting. I had never known this before, so this is great. I hope you guys out there are finding this as interesting as I am. Okay, um, and that also answers the next question. So I'll just skip ahead because you're <laughs> answering so much. Um, okay, so even though in the UK there's only really just been one sort of minor mutation, I'd call it, um, do you think then we would have any risk of that mutating further in New Zealand um, in our context or again because it's been pretty stable we don't need to worry. So I mean sometimes there's no point in worrying about things you can't control um, so there's always a risk that the virus mutates. Um, SARS-1 did I think um, and but it mutated away that just because of the mutations it became less infective and then that helped it peter out. Um, SARS-CoV-2 um, or COVID-19, sorry. COVID-19 is the name of the virus. SARS-CoV-2 is what you get when you're sick with it. Um, slight distinction, it's kind of like HIV is the virus and AIDS is what you get sick with it. So um, as COVID-19 may mutate, you know, it has so far, most of those mutations have done nothing. So yes, we should be concerned um, especially the longer a pandemic goes on, the more people are infected, the more opportunity for mutation, which is why it's so good that the vaccines are coming online now, so we can hopefully shut that down. It's why it's disappointing that some countries are really, really bad at taking steps to limit the spread, because it gives more of an opportunity for another outbreak that countries aren't ready for, um, or are unable to, to kind of take a second hit after thinking that we've got through this. If we have to go back to square one with vaccine development, we're looking at another year, year and a half before that's ready again, and that's just devastating. So it is concerning. There's nothing we can do about it other than hope that those countries get their ass in line, um, mm. and also that the vaccines get out shortly. Um, but New Zealand can keep up its closed border type status um, until those vaccines come through. Okay. So I'll change. But yeah, I should, I should caveat. The current mutation has no evidence to suggest that it actually is more effective or that it is more harmful or that the vaccine won't work against it. So there is currently no evidence that that is the case, but the longer that the, the pandemic goes on, the more possibility that that might happen. Just mm. thought I'd kind okay. of bring it down again, like it is actually not something to be worried about in the immediate now. Okay, so everybody freaking out about different strains and it not even being affected or effective for COVID, that's just a myth. Okay, we'll put those comments. Yeah, it's, it's, there's not, I wouldn't go to the extent of saying it a myth, but there's not currently evidence to suggest that. Yeah. Okay. Such a scientist. <laughs> Great. All right, I'll um, slightly change track. So one of the questions here is asking you, Ben, what are your thoughts on the virus being infectious, infectious from frozen goods and the Americold cluster and any thoughts on China's ambitious claims of virus originating anywhere but China? I did not know they had tried to claim that. Um, maybe start with the first half. No. So I'll start with the first half. The virus surviving on frozen goods is a really interesting thought experiment, right? So, so we did have that, that cluster that came out of a frozen goods processing plant. Um, it seems like, and the last I checked, that the most likely story was still that it came through workers and contact rather than actually on the frozen goods. Viruses do survive well in the cold. Um, kind of viruses and bacteria are opposite. Most people think, oh, if you want to get sick, you're warm, humid, everything will grow. Viruses don't. Viruses need to live in something to grow. So on surfaces, viruses survive much better in the cold and the dry. And so that is why there's always that potential in frozen goods that they might live on the surface or something like that. Um, bacteria, on the other hand, living on the surface, they're gonna slowly die um, and that they need to be in warm environments to actually grow and thrive. So kind of opposites, viruses and bacteria. Um, so there is a possibility that 
someone with COVID coughs on something frozen that then gets shipped around the world that then someone else licks or touches and then touches their face, right? So that it's not totally unreasonable. There is a kind of like a biological route, but it is so much more likely that someone just coughs near someone else and the aerosols um, kind of the, the, the particles, the droplets go from one person to another. So it's possible. There's not good evidence to suggest that there has been any kind of major um, transmission chain because of that. Um, but the good thing about frozen goods is that they're also very easy to wash um, because they're all frozen. So you can, if, if you are concerned, um, washing is always an option. Um, you can just, you know, wash down the often they're in cardboard or plastic or something. So, um, yeah, give, give them a wash if you're worried. Um, I don't think it's a particular cause for concern. You can always buy local um, as the other option. So if you're buying goods within New Zealand, you know that that's going to be covered free. So a little plug to, to buy local there if, if that is a, a concern for you. Nice. Um, as for China, um, not originating originating in China, uh, it's kind of a moot point, to be honest. I, th I think there's not a good reason to play the blame game. Um, like th th things like this can happen in any country. I know we point to you know the, the wet market as being a you know particular melting pot of um, you know reason for disease and things like that. Um, which is kind of true. It's also a little bit xenophobic because most of the molecular dating puts it a little bit before the Wuhan market. So it's originated around there and then the Wuhan market was likely the first cluster that came out of it, um, which also kind of makes sense because a lot of those early cases, some of those early cases, sorry, weren't actually directly linked with that. And so, um, yeah, like, like wherever animals live, there are viruses, sometimes they can transmit. Bats are particularly bad for that um, and that they... I think they're also um, kind of one of the vectors for Ebola. Um, so you kind of just need to live in an area with those animals and there'll be some kind of cross contact, um, often sometimes even through just the, the, the bat poo and things like that. So yeah, trying to, try to point fingers and go, oh, it's, it's your fault or, or it, it, you know, it didn't actually come from here. We just got infected from somewhere else. That like, it, it's, it's really a, a moot point. I think you can look at the way you respond once an outbreak happens and absolutely criticize that. But trying to say it's your fault for having a, uh, an outbreak or you know, a, a virus existing in your country in the first place is kind of negligent and you would have to, but the only solution to that is to just exterminate all mammals or, or something like that, which is just absurd. Um, although New Zealand, we do sometimes think about that because we don't have native mammals um, <laughs> other than the bat um, ourselves. So yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know whether it's valid or not. I haven't looked into it, but I think it's a, a red herring. It's not something that you really should pursue in terms of associating blame. Yeah, it, it, it is sort of irrelevant where it started when you think about where we are right now. But it, unless yep. there's evidence to say it's originated anywhere else, was there not a lot of research done, you know, some six, ten months ago now that could find the originating source? So, yes and no. We know relatively closely the originating source, right? So I don't know whether we'll ever find the exact animal that had the, the virus before it jumped to a person, um, or the exact first patient or anything like that, right? We can get pretty damn good. Um, and what I was referencing there in terms of the molecular clock, we can figure out based on its mutation rate when it would likely first jump to people. Um, and that dates around November. Um, some go kind of late October, some go uh, mid-November, but it was definitely a little bit before that Wuhan market. So there is a possibility that someone from some other country flew in and then that happened to be the first one, but it doesn't matter. Um, and, and we would never really be able to find that out unless someone did happen to find that the perfect sequence or, you know, for some good, good reason why um, that was the case. Um, and there really isn't that evidence. There is a lot of evidence um, that there are a lot of bats around the Wuhan area that have viruses that are very similar um, and that there are enough other animals and stuff going on that you could have got that dual transfer so the current theory or at least the last time i checked was kind of from bat to possibly a pangolin a little bit of mixing um and then from the pangolin to then a person so like that seems like the the most likely route or it was just in bats and we haven't found the particular bat that had that particular virus yet so 
Yeah, I and mean, we can keep looking, um, and a lot of research will keep going on into it. Um, more and more and more of the viruses are getting sequenced every day, which is fantastic in terms of building up that data. Um, but trying to look for a source outside China is very, very slim um, mm. on that actually being the case whatsoever. And that makes sense. I guess the question is, and I'm sorry if I randomly say sneeze. Um, okay, you, you talk. I'm going to say. what? It went no way. Okay. Um, the reason that I'm so interested is because, you know, you find the source of something or as close as you can and then find a way to mitigate that to the absolute extent possible from it ever happening again. Um, and so that's yeah. why I, so, I mean, this is interesting. Yeah. So, like, thinking about the source, the source was a animal to human transfer of a virus. And then Usually when that happens, viruses don't do too well in the person because they haven't evolved to live in the person. And so it actually happens kind of common, uh, commonly. It, it's not that uncommon that you catch a virus from an animal. It's very unusual for the then you to transfer that to another person. And it's exceptionally unusual for that to happen in a very efficient way that can cause a global pandemic. So <laughs> this is uncommon. Um, but there are an awful lot of people, so there's an awful lot of you know chance for this to happen. Um, what I think we can learn from it in terms of mitigating is keeping up very good back, uh, virus surveillance, um, particularly of wild animals um, and things in the population, so you have a good idea of what's around. What we've managed to do in terms of developing a vaccine within a year and a half is just mind-blowingly quick. So that's another great mitigating factor that going forward we know what's actually achievable. Um, and we might be able to get that fast track. We've also had the whole world learn how to shut down countries, how to shut down economies and effectively put up blockades to stop the spread of a virus very, very quickly. And if you do that early enough, like New Zealand did, like some other countries did, you can actually limit that spread immensely and then you can control outbreaks and then it doesn't actually have to become this huge global pandemic. Um, you can, if you want to point the finger a wee bit at China and, and that they were slow in sharing some of the early data, particularly around the person-to-person -person transfer. For a long time, it was thought, at like weeks extra, we're not talking months here, but weeks extra, it was thought that you couldn't get person-to-person -person transfer. That turned out to be completely wrong. Um, and there is reason to think that they knew that a little bit earlier than they let on. So that's definitely a valid criticism of going, you know, things like the World Health Organization need to be supported fully and need to be um, funded in a way that they can continue to be independent and you know, pull all these resources together and make sure countries are willing to share that quickly. That's also why it's not great to do too much blaming of origin source because that might make countries reluctant to come forward. And if that happens, that's really when you get bad outbreaks because it can brew for a long time before exporting to the rest of the world. Mm, and it makes sense. Um, okay, so moving on um, to talking to about sort of track and trace. Do you know anything about the system that we've got in Australia or um, do you know anything about that one, Ben? Sorry, in the track and trace? Yeah, how, like Australia's model. I haven't looked into Australia's model on what they're doing. Yeah, neither. I'm not quite sure what this question was. Is, but, is there a um, little more information as to what they're looking at there? Is our track and tracing capabilities as good as Australia? If not, what can we do to improve it? If it's as good, any thoughts as to why New Zealand hasn't opened borders with Australia? Right. So... Uh, it's hard to know what our current capacity for track and tracing is because it hasn't been tested, um, it hasn't been stress tested recently. Uh, and so I know that that has improved. Um, pretty much we had to build everything as we went. I say we, I'm not involved at all. Um, but it, a lot of that track and trace capacity is, is constantly being improved, right? We've recently rolled out Bluetooth um, in the uh, Tracer app as well, which should increase our tracking and tracing capabilities. Um, so that is, come a long way and because it hasn't been stress tested recently by an outbreak which is very good that it hasn't um i'm not sure exactly where that sits and, and how well that is effectively you want your track and trace capacity big enough that if you find an outbreak you can track them all shut them down very very quickly isolate anyone that might be a close contact so it doesn't spread um, so it doesn't need to be actually be huge if we have really good border control. The more we open our border, the better our track and tracing needs to be. Um, and the more willing people need to be and to actually go and get shut down, right? Currently, most of us are living enormously free within our country, but there's that huge border issue. 
the more the border opens up, so the more we have that flow, the more likely we as individuals are going to get locked down within our own country. So that's kind of a bit of a trade-off that you have to um, kind of deal with, I guess, as, as we look to open up bubbles. Um, Trans-Tasman bubble, that looks like it is um, potentially going ahead shortly. Um, honestly, that, that's up to the government to decide when, and it's, the government has a much better idea of what their capacity is. And it, it, the, they need to know that if an outbreak happens, right? So if we get a whole plane load of Australians infected, what does that look like? How well can we deal with that? Um, what does that kind of mean? And so, and I don't, I don't have those details. I'm not in cabinet briefings. Um, uh, so yeah, you should have voted for me, then I would have. Um, I'm sure this will be interesting. Voted to your party. Um, and and our party, yeah, yeah, we needed that top vote. Um, so. <laughs> It's really it's up to the government um, to know the capacity that we have and they're probably taking it precautiously, which is probably a good thing at the moment, um, especially coming into Christmas. They're likely to be more cautious uh, because they don't want to have a lockdown just before Christmas. Um, after Christmas, they might be a little bit more open to opening up. People feeling like it's a new year, feeling like, cool, things are progressing, things are moving, um, and, and there'll be more of an expectation that, that that will, and politicians do often respond a little bit to expectations. So we'll have to wait and see, really. And just on that, and I don't want to get luxury, but please, everybody, just be reminded just to check in. It takes less than 20 seconds and it can avoid huge areas if they're locking down again. They can get really targeted into really small geographic areas if they have the information. So please take that 20 seconds. It's not a long time. Okay, sorry, I just really wanted to just remind you all because it's easy to forget, um, <laughs> but it is important. Uh, okay. I just want to quickly check if I've missed um, some questions in this main chat because I saw one a little no, bit no, earlier. Good. Checking in um, is an important part of it. Ben, this was something we covered early on, but I think this person came in a little bit later. So they just want to know the information around um, New Zealand's process for procurement. Um, and you mentioned it right at the start, but maybe if you just want to touch on that again because I think they missed that bit. Um, just commenting on the government's procurement procedures that they followed in selecting and purchasing the vaccines that they're, um, okay. yeah, set aside. Nope. Would you, sorry, you say that again? I've, I've missed it. You know, audio is not coming through great. Oh, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm just checking in with Kane, everybody. Bear with me. Okay, we've lost. We've lost. Ben. It, it, I'm not sure who's who's coming out. It might be me. It's you, Ben. Okay, sorry, it was my internet that was going bad. <laughs> sorry, everybody, be with us for a minute. Ben's gonna refresh his browser. Uh, yeah. Are we are we back good now? Or are we still still terrible? I can hear. You. That's good. Okay, we'll just... Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great, great. Okay, Ben, so what the question that you missed when you kind of froze up there was um, asking if you could comment on the government's procurement procedures around the selection of the vaccines that are coming to New Zealand. Okay. Yeah? Right, yeah. So, so New Zealand's procurement... Um, we've signed up to a big conglomerate that effectively put in money to a number of different um, vaccines. I think there was only 25 candidates in there. The most successful of those uh, will get selected and come through. We've also specifically bought um, into, I think, the Pfizer one or the, the Envitech, um mRNA vaccine. Um, and so, so we've both bought into the conglomerate and into the specific um, and then it'll be a question of whatever one comes out as most effective, and we will then get that. Um, it's possible that we've overbought, which is fine. If we have, then we can donate to aid and things like that, um, although we're unsure how long we're going to need those for. Um, 
yeah, so that, that's largely the procurement. It will need to go through New Zealand's drug checking process, which it usually goes through MedSafe as the, um, the government organisation that checks that our medicines are safe and effective uh, in New Zealand. And sometimes they do independent testing. In this case, I think they will probably rely on the international reports because New Zealand can't really do vaccine trials when we don't have people with COVID in our country. So that's just one of those things that you, you need active cases in order to run a trial there. So we rely on international data. Um, and then if that passes our safety bar, then it will get procured. So they could go to the people in our quarantine facilities, arguably. OK, I've lost all audio. OK. Sorry, Ron, we've lost. I think we've lost Ben. Um, but I've gone through um, all my questions and I'm hoping that we got through all of yours. Um, of course, please do feel free to uh, put more comments in this chat after. I'm sure Ben will come back and uh, put any other put any other answers in to cover off all of your questions. Um, and hopefully you can, you know, bust some myths that you're hearing online in your communities and with your friends because, you know, misinformation is can be a really dangerous thing and we just need to work together to make sure that everybody has the right information and then they can make the decisions based on correct data. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. And I'm sorry, that we, oh, we might have been back just to say goodbye. Hopefully. Um, yeah, apologies about that, team. The Wi-Fi going all, all fritzed on me. Um, <laughs> That's all good, Ben. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It was so good to see you again. All good. Can I cover one last question? This one came up. Please, um, please I don't know if we've got asked in the street. So there was just the case of um, the COVID vaccine giving false positives on HIV tests. So um, genuine, true story that, that happened in Australia pulled the pin on that particular vaccine development. Um, I just want to cover it because you'll see it in the news um, and it is it is actually kind of expected. So in Australia, they had a particular um, design uh, for a vaccine where they used a piece of protein from HIV um, to help stabilize the spike protein um, that, of the COVID vaccine. Now, the reason they used an HIV protein is just because it's been really well characterized. So we know what that piece of protein does. Effectively, it holds, it acts like a clamp and it holds the little spike protein on top of it in a good formation so it looks um, how it should look. So the researchers knew that it was a possibility that we would then have uh, an immune response not just to the thing on top, but also to the clamp that was holding it, um, which is exactly what happened. So people who had that vaccine made it, got an immune response to the HIV protein as well as the COVID protein. Um, and that meant that when they were then tested for HIV, um, the test tested for antibodies towards HIV, that that came up as a positive. Even though they never had HIV, they never had any um, possibility of having HIV from that vaccine. Um, there was just that there was a piece of protein that was that immune response was elicited from, and then that got picked up in the testing. So there isn't actually any HIV involved, but the Australian government thought that that would decrease people's confidence um, in vaccines in general if that was a vaccine that was rolled out. And so that's why they decided to pull that vaccine from um, circulation. It wasn't to do with the safety, it was to do with the public perception. And so I thought mm. I'd just, if you see that one around, yes, it was giving positive HIV tests. No, it wasn't giving people HIV or AIDS. That's so interesting. What I love, I love science. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm just a student. Um, this is great. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I always find this these chats so helpful. And yeah, it was great to speak with you tonight. Well, good. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm sure we'll uh, see more as the updates keep rolling in. For sure. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us.